Let's go to John in New Orleans. What's up, Brother John? Hey, Dr. John. How are you doing today? I'm all right, my brother. How are you? Um, I'm redefining the word good, but it's an uh, honor to speak with you. Uh, I can already tell. I'm sorry, man. T tell me about it. What's going on? Um, 38 days ago, my daughter had some blood in her stool. And next thing we knew, it was sugar toxin E. coli, <sighs> which produced in the HUS, causing her kidneys to fail. They had to... Um, Life flighter from the hospital we were at to a much uh, bigger hospital here in New Orleans. And then uh, the next morning, she coded for two and a half hours. Um, it was probably the most terrifying and amazing thing I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, for two and a half hours, as they did chest compressions, and then they put her on ECMO. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was on ECMO for eight days on a vent for another um, 15, or well, she was on a vent for a total of 15 days. And we were told that there was a 2% chance of her kidneys regaining function. And we had some pretty horrible conversations with some doctors. And we had some, uh, we made some pretty horrible decisions that parents should never have to make. Mm -hmm. And before we made probably the worst decision a parent can make, we asked about transferring to another hospital. And we did that, and everything changed. I mean, everything. Um, the next morning they were going to start the dialysis again and we saw a blue line on her diaper and hmm. she's, she's her kidneys. The kidney doctor told us, uh, two days ago that it's a 90% recovery of her kidneys. But the bigger thing is, is that during that two and a half hours of CPR, she suffered global, um, brain damage to the mm. deep brain tissue. Yep. And her left side has been mostly paralyzed, okay. but um, doctors told us that she would probably never be able to do much of anything. And I'm telling you, when I originally emailed the show to today, it's so different, but she's, she's smiling. Mm -hmm. She's, she's laughing. She's, she's trying to clap her hands. It's, it's so amazing to see how resilient this little baby is. Hmm. Um, but we're, I mean, we're, we live in a parent first nightmare and we've got a long way to go and we don't know, um, we don't know what the end is going to look like. Yeah. Whew. So first and foremost, dude, like if I was, if we were just hanging out, I'll give you a hug. And I'd probably hold it a little too long. Okay. I'm sorry, man. Me too. Um, gosh, there's so much here. <sighs> I guess the, the first thing is y'all... Y'all got a rare opportunity to rappel down into the bowels of hell. Mm. And have to ask questions and have conversations that no parent ever, ever, ever should have to have. And to resolve to make decisions that no parent should have to have and then find out that had you made that decision, it might not have been the right way. You know what I mean? Like you've been in heavy trauma, right? Absolutely. Yes. yes um, hey, uh, do me a favor. Talk directly into the phone for me. Yes, oh, there we go. Um, <laughs> And then you've got the illness. Does everybody blaming everybody for this? Parents beat themselves up horrifically over things like this. Yeah, that was, um, yeah, it's, how, how can we cope with the guilt of not, not protecting her better? Like, you know, like that's our job as parents. Um, so yeah, dealing with that has been, been rough. Yeah. I think the, Protection is something we strive for, but in many ways it's an illusion. True. And you got to see, I mean, you just got your bubble burst on that illusion sooner than most, right? Um, and in a much more horrific way than most, right? Usually people find that out when their kids are in a car wreck or they break an arm or they, you know, get COVID or something. And yours end up with, jeez. 
H U S. I mean, geez Louise, man, what a mess. And kidney failure. Um, I think that ultimately you got to sit down and grieve this whole thing start to finish and y'all aren't there yet. And so the pressure you putting on yourself right now to solve this, what do we do now? I'm going to tell you what you do right now is you get to tomorrow. And then you get to the next day and then you get to the next day. You're in mile 14 of a marathon and you're trying to figure out how you can best massage your calves and best fix your hurting hip. You got to finish the race and y'all still got a ways to go. Does that make sense? Yes. I would love to see y'all take care of your basic needs, eating and sleeping and being with other people. Do you have other kids? Yeah, we've got a, we've got a five-year-old daughter. Jeez Louise. Um, so those conversations are tough too, right? Correct. Yeah, that was, um, you know, we were, I originally, it was like, how do I explain to my five-year-old that her sister isn't coming home? Mm -hmm. But now it's, how do I explain to my five-year-old that when her sister does come home, that she's not going to be the same? In very clear, simple terms. Kids won't have the same baggage that you and I will have. And they will be very more, uh, very much more understanding. So it's as simple as little sis got very, very sick. And so she's not going to be able to move her left leg and her left foot very well. And then a natural question for a six-year-old or a five-year-old is, well, am I going to get that sick? And you say, no, probably not. It's very, very, very rare. It almost never happens. But little sis got it. And so we're going to have to help out. And you are going to get to really help your baby sister. And using words like her baby and her baby sister will give her some autonomy and some ownership. And that helps quell that in that anxiety. And that little girl is going to absorb mom and dad's grief and sadness. And that's okay. What's really important though, is that y'all communicate with her. We're very sad about little sister. Not like, no, it's all good. We're just plugging along and, we're, and fake smiling in front of your six-year-old or five-year-old because she's going to absorb the tension and she's going to think it's her fault. And she's going to absorb the gap between what she feels and what y'all are saying and what she's seeing with her sister. And so it's just being really honest and saying words like, I'm really sad. I'm really sad that baby got really sick. Daddy's really sad that um, he wanted to protect his little girl and she got sick from a little tiny old bug that I couldn't protect him from. And um, I'm very, very sad that she got so sick. It's being that kind of honest in that, un that language that she can understand, not overthinking it. And also not belaboring it all the time too. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. Um, what I'd really love y'all to see is y'all get home and get settled at home and sleep in your own bed together as, as all four of you. And then as the reality of this begins to set in, because right now you're still running on fumes and you're still running on adrenaline and cortisol and you get home and are able to exhale. <sighs> That's when the deep grief of this thing will go. Okay. Yeah, we're too late. We haven't been home since this whole thing started. That's right. And so you haven't slept. Your mind's not clear. You're probably not eating very well. Um, do you have people coming up to the hospital to be with you guys? Yeah, we've got a very good support system. Here. Okay. It would be a gift to you and to them to give them some very detailed jobs. I need someone to go mow my yard. I need someone to go vacuum my house and wipe down the kitchen cabinets. I need someone to bring us food and vegetables and fruits. So we don't have to eat McDonald's again, right? It's a very specific jobs. And you've got a team of people around you who are dying for something to do, to be a part of this and help. And you're going to have to say, here's what I need and let them go chase that down. Is that cool? Yeah, yeah we've, we've, we've been doing that. We've got a really good, like I said, really good support system. Great. And yeah, we're, we're eating too much. I'm eating too much. <laughs> my wife's probably not eating enough. Dude, I would be, yeah, I don't even want, yeah, I would not be taking care of myself very well. Um, no. But it comes a moment when taking care of yourself well. Um, I'm going to ask you a really hard question, okay? Okay. Um. And so, no, I'm going to ask you a hard question. And no, it's not a kind question, but I want to be real direct with you, okay? Did you intentionally feed your little girl something infected with E. coli with the intention of making her sick? Absolutely not. 
then this is not your fault. Okay? You hear me? Yeah. It's not your fault. And I'll go further to say, any meditation on this is our fault, this is us, we should have, we, we should have, is a choice to take. It's a, it's a false control over something that's already happened with a period at the end. Okay? So the greatest gift you can give yourself, your wife, your marriage, your kid, and say, this is the same goes for your, your wife too, is to live as much as possible in the right now. And one thing that the doctors seem to have proven to you over and over again is their predictions are terrible, <laughs> right? Yeah, and she's defied the odds both for the good and the bad. There you go. And my gut tells me is she'll continue to. That's, that's what we're hoping for. The therapies that are available to young children, and again, I'm not in the business of false hope. The number of parents I've had to tell them that I've, I've been the guy that comes and sits in that little square room with you and your wife and says, your baby's not going to make it, okay? So I'm not in the business of giving false hope. Um, my oldest best friend on the planet is a traumatic brain survivor and the change in technology and therapies that they have been able to come up with over the last 20 years is astounding. And I tell you that to tell you, I think you've got every reason to walk out of that hospital with your head held high. Okay. And quite frankly, the other alternative is to walk out with your head held low and that's not going to get anybody anything. Do be heartbroken and do be really sad. Right. We've done a lot of that. Yeah. And dude, you're going to keep doing it for a while. And there's going to come a moment when she's four and she's either running around the neighborhood and you're going to be grieving over what almost was, or you'll be pushing her in a, some futuristic looking wheelchair while you're out at the zoo and it will just overcome you with like a wave. That how unfair it is that she's not running around the other kids and it will be what it is and let that thing come and feel it and own it. And then bend down and give that girl a kiss right on her big sweaty forehead and say, let's go see the lions. Right? Yes. But you are in the middle of this and this is not that moment. This is the moment to be with your wife, to be with your baby little girl, to be with your five-year-old. And they keep telling the doctors, not in this house. Right? Yeah. I'm, I'm glad we, we didn't make, make the decision that everyone was telling us we needed to make. Yes, be at peace with that. Yeah. And, and forgive yourself for even contemplating it. Okay. You got to stop hanging on to it, man. Yeah. Yeah. You had a dance with the devil and then you backed out. It's good. Good for you. What good made y'all change hospitals? Um, honestly, it was the dialysis. Um, she was going from acute to chronic. Mm -hmm. And the hospital we were at did not do chronic dialysis. So we had to go to the children's hospital that, that does the chronic dialysis. Mm -hmm. So that, that was the driving force of, of the move. Wow. That's fantastic, man. And then it just, so when she, your child moved over, they just, their care was just different and better and she got, she perked up. Um, I, something happened in the ambulance on the way between the two hospitals. She, she fell asleep for the first time in days. Mm -hmm. Um, she didn't, she pretty much didn't wake up for about 36 hours. And, um, that was, you know, that was when everything started to change. Wow. I mean, everything. It was, they were legitimately there to hook the dialysis machine up. And we were repositioning her when we noticed the blue line on our diaper so that they could get access to the catheter ports. Yeah. Dude, that's amazing. It, and each day has gotten better. Each day we're getting a little bit more of her back. Mm -hmm. But there's still a lot of her 
a lot of her missing. Of course. And there, and honestly, there might be, there might be, um, and that's not for today. Is that fair? Yes. Very fair. Um, do keep this. Uh, I want you to get away from the hospital if you can in the next day or two. Get out to some sunshine. And I want you to go pick up a journal at a Barnes & Noble or someplace. And I want you to begin writing it down. All of it. What you feel, what you think, what you're upset about, what you're mad about, what you're scared about. And the goal is when she turns 18, you're going to hand this over to her. And you're going to say, this is the journey we took with you. This is how much we loved you. This is how long we've loved you. This is a shadow of how much we're going to continue to love you moving forward. But write all that stuff down. For you, for your wife, for your little one, your five-year-old, for everybody. I'm grateful for you, man, and my, my heart is broken for you. I wish I had something that I could snap my fingers. I can't. Um, I can just tell you as, a, as another dad, I love you, and I'm so sorry. So, so sorry, man.